A very warm good evening to everyone here who is joining us for our webinar today. My name is Pavna Dukkar and I'm here representing the SIET team. First and foremost, thank you everyone who has joined us for the webinar, which is on HRM and the future of work with the University of Israel. Human resource management is one of the top most popular courses with great career prospects worldwide. Studying in masters, studying a master's in human resource management in the UK means opening a, a world of opportunities and learning from the best experts and researchers in the field. So to help you find out more about studying HRM and the future prospects, I welcome Dr. Paul Thomas, Dr. Harry Pitt and Doris from the University of Bristol. I also welcome all the students and parents who actually have taken out time for our session today. So on that note, a um, few of you may not know what SIUK is and perhaps what we do. So just a quick introduction on SIUK. So SIUK is a global organization with its presence spread across 25 countries. We are the official representatives of UK universities. We assist students across the globe to seek admission in the top universities with our premium sourcing for Oxbridge, Russell Group and non Russell Group universities. In case you need extra information on our services, requesting everyone to visit our website that's www.studying-uk.com. So on that note, now I would like to introduce our um, key speaker of the webinar today, um, Dr. Ho Thomas and uh, Dr. Harry Pui, who are uh, lecturer in Management University of Bristol. So before I hand over this session to Dr. Ho, the webinar will be followed by Q&A session allowing you to ask any query you may have regarding courses, entry requirements, scholarship, placements, and application for September 2021, January 2022 in date. So let's begin. So Dr. Hall, the floor is all yours. Great, thank you uh, very much. And, and thanks for everyone uh, joining in today uh, via uh, Zoom or on, on YouTube. Um, so today we're going to be doing a, a kind of a, a taster lecture. Um, and uh, first I'm going to be talking about the new uh, MSc program in human resource management and the future at work here at the University of Bristol. New program um, and it's launching in September uh, 2021, September this year. And we're really excited about uh, this new program and excited to be uh, talking about it today. Um, and also after a kind of a brief kind of introduction of, of the program and, and what the program is interested in and kind of looking at, um, myself and Harry are going to be doing kind of a taster lecture where we're going to be discussing uh, the future or the futures of work, um, changes in the world of work and the particular kind of perspectives that uh, we're interested in and the kind of perspectives that ground uh, this particular uh, program. And so hopefully you should spark up some, some questions um, and some of your own interests about what the future of work uh, means to you um, as kind of students um, entering, entering the world of work, whether that's in um, employment or whether you're thinking about going on and studying, uh, studying further. Um, so just a quick kind of introduction about uh, who we are. Um, I'm Dr. Hugh Thomas. Uh, I'm a lecturer in Work Employment Organization and Public Policy here at the University of Bristol in the School of Management. And I'm also Program Director for this new uh, Masters on Human Resource Management and the Future of Work. And uh, Harry, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I was just looking at that picture of me and thinking how much I've changed in the lockdown uh, <laughs> without, without any trips to the barbers. Um, yeah, I'm Harry Pitts. I'm a lecturer in the Work Employment Organization and Public Policy Group. And I also lead a faculty research group in perspectives on work. Um, and then together with Hugh, um, I'm one of the co-editors of our, our flagship online magazine um, at Bristol, uh, Futures of Work, um, which we take a lot of pieces and, and publish a lot of scholarship on there about um, some of the things you're going to hear about today. Yeah, and also I actually um, just put this extra uh, slide in just this morning to say if you're interested um, in kind of following up some of the points and the debates that we're going to be talking about today, please do go and have a look at our online magazine, um, futuresofwork.co.uk. Um, on there, you'll find a wealth of really interesting um, kind of uh, articles that are in a kind of um, often sort of um, 
uh, non-academic kind of uh, tone, but grounded in, in academic research. And so if you're interested in knowing more, please do go and have a look at that. We've recently released a new issue that was out this week, I believe earlier this week. So um, hot off the press. Um, so what is the new uh, MSc on human resource management and the future of work all about? Um, well, it's the, the basics is that it's a, it's a one year, uh, 12 uh, month um, full time uh, program. Like I said earlier, it's, it's launching uh, this year for the first time and we're really excited about it. Um, and it's a specialized master's. Um, and so that means that it's a master's uh, which should build upon what you've already covered during your undergraduate degree whether you've done business or management or sociology or political science or whatever it might have been that in the kind of field of, of social sciences, uh, this program will hopefully allow you to kind of uh, pick up some of those debates you've had um, in that undergraduate and apply them further specifically to the kind of uh, fields and areas of human resource management and the future of work. And the program is all about trying to think about and respond and address to some of the major challenges and opportunities facing the world of work, whether this is uh, the climate crisis, whether it's the implications of, of COVID-19, whether it's about technological development, whether it's about rising inequality. Uh, this program is a kind of forward thinking program um, and not one which is um, uh, rooted in just thinking about uh, organizations and their HR policies and practices but thinking about the wider implications of um, business operations and business activities rooted in uh, particular countries, particular areas uh, within the kind of um, overarching concepts of, of political economy. Um, so uh, it requires yeah, prior qualification in, in social sciences um, and um, we've got really great graduate prospects. Uh, you probably see all this stuff on the university's uh, website. If you if you have a look on University of Bristol, it'll be some of the top things you'll see on the landing page. Um, we're uh, very highly ranked when it comes to being uh, targeted by uh, top employers. We've got excellent career service uh, offerings um, in the uh, in the university, and this course is not just about preparing students for a, a career in human resource management, although that is obviously one of its uh, focus, but um, has a kind of a broad remit uh, to think about varying different um, uh, employment opportunities, very diff varying different um, job opportunities you might be interested in going into the future, whether that's in the public sector, whether that's in the third sector, whether it's thinking about going into uh, further opportunities for doing research, using this as a springboard to maybe considering doing a PhD as well. So although human resource management is, is fundamental and in that, in that title, it is not just about um, human resource management. We have really good industry associations. Um, we make sure that our, our program is grounded in kind of real life examples and grounded in our research led teaching of something which we're very proud of in the University of Bristol, uh, bringing our academic research into the classroom um, and seeing this as a kind of mutually beneficial and reinforcing um, activity. And we've got a really interesting guest lecture series um, starting um, next semester. Uh, we're also in the really great city of, of Bristol, um, and that's to say that there's there's more to life than academia. Um, and so if you're thinking about coming and studying um, a postgraduate uh, course in, in the UK or wherever it might be, one of the things to really do is research the city in which it's going to be based in and see if... Um, if it's somewhere that you want to go and live uh, for, for a year. Uh, and I would say that Bristol, and I'm sure Harry would probably say similar things, that Bristol is a great place to live. Um, we're often ranked in like the top uh, UK universities for, for student experience. Um, and I know that a lot of our students, especially our postgrad students, really enjoy um, their time um, here, here in Bristol. We've got a really lively music scene when it's not uh, COVID. Great place to eat and drink, loads of good shops, nice green spaces. Um, and also, you know, people are probably interested about being close to London. Uh, it's also close to the, the beautiful Southwest as well, of where, uh, especially where Harry's from. Um, and so it's a great place. It's a great place to live. So that's my pitch um, for the, the MSE. Um, just to do a very quick thing on the structure. Um, it's uh, like I said, it's a 12 month course uh, in the first uh semester in the first teaching block, you look at kind of contemporary work and human resource management. Um, you'd actually be taught by myself and Harry. Uh, we both have a, a unit each in that first teaching block. 
Um, and during that teaching block, you kind of get to grips with some of the uh, fundamentals when it comes to understanding um, the future of work and understanding about uh, the place of work in kind of capitalist uh, society, as well as the international uh, nature of work as well. That although this is a program at the University of Bristol in the UK, it's very much an internationally focused program and our examples will be coming from a range of sources rather than just um, the UK. Then in the second teaching block, we kind of turn our analytical attention and focus to what the future of work or futures of work might mean. Um, uh, with particular focus on kind of alternative forms of work and organizations and a strong focus on some of the kind of major challenges facing our society, whether that's the climate crisis, uh, inequality, or obviously the pandemic uh, at the moment as well. And then in your final teaching block, you, you do a dissertation where you pick uh, kind of something which you have um, enjoyed and covered during the program and devote in intensive uh, research uh, time um, to producing an independent uh, piece of um, piece of work where you, um, um, you know, actually uh, produce a, a long piece of research that might be used as a springboard for further employment, or maybe for um, thinking about uh, going into research uh, in the future. So, what do we mean by the future of work? Uh, well, this is actually um, me going to uh, Google Images the other day and just typing in future of work to see what uh, is the kind of uh, common kind of ideas and predictions about what the future of work uh, might mean. Um, and there's obviously a lot of hype at the moment about the future of work, uh, particularly this idea of whether it's going to be a kind of technological utopia uh, or, or a dystopia where workers are going are to go and take our jobs. Um, you'll see all these articles that um, come in newspapers, we'll see a, a, some of them in a minute, of, you know, ma machines are going to cook us dinner, they're going to drive us home, they're going to look after our children, they're going to uh, operate on us. Um, you see cases of where they say, well, com computers can now convincingly beat chess grandmasters, what else could they be uh, capable of? Um, and this kind of raises this question of whether we are living in potentially the last days of human toil. Um, and whether there is an actual future of work out there or whether there's multiple alternatives and the question of uh, whether, we've, uh, whether we've been here before. Um, so I'd now like to pass it over to, to, to Harry to, um, to answer the question. Harry, are, are robots coming to uh, take our jobs? Well, you'd certainly think so, um, based upon the way that this has been discussed in the press and, you know, at the, say the World Economic Forum, um, by politicians in po kind of popular culture, this idea that robots are going to come and take away our jobs in a kind of like-for-like -like fashion. Now, a lot of the kind of academic research on this, you know, and that's going to be core to the way we're looking at the topic on this um, on this program, uh, plays with that a little bit and says, well, maybe it's not so simple. Um, but of course headlines always go for the easiest and most compelling and sometimes the most frightening story. Um, so the general assumption has been over the past, say, five to 10 years, is that we're facing a serious catastrophe, really, um, oncoming to human life is going to displace humans from work. Now, can you change the slide, please, uh, Hugh? Now, this same idea has come and gone several times already. I mean, in fact, the same idea has captivated people since the Industrial Revolution. So the idea that the advancement of machinery was going to um, throw humans on the scrap heap. Um, so, you know, every 10 or 20 years, you get a succession of airport best-selling books. Um, so here's a few examples from different different times, 70s and 80s, the collapse of work, the 1990s, the end of work. Today, we have books with absurd titles like fully automated luxury communism, which is, of course, you know, a lot of words put together, but, you know, sums up a utopian vision for the future of work. Um, I'm not making it up. Um, and this comes and goes. So we need to also have a bit of historical perspective. And that's partly what I'm in the unit that I'm going to be doing in that in that first uh, first semester of the programme, kind of looking at how these ideas have come and gone um, over time. Can you change the slide, please, Hugh? The difference may be, I mean, the crucial question is, is this time different? Do the technological potentials ahead of us today 
represents something that's going to change everything. Um, and are we at a real turning point? Now, some people say that the combination of different technologies available to us in what's called the fourth industrial revolution. So automation, artificial intelligence, machine learning, 3D printing, Internet of Things, uh, all kinds of different um, uh, technologies wrapped together have a much more transformative potential than the, the previous iterations of those technologies in the past. And really what people think is crucial here is their capacity not just to displace manual physical jobs in, say, a factory, but also emulate intellectual tasks associated with professional services work, so in a legal firm. Um, or, or in a uh, tax accountancy, for instance. So different groups of workers are affected differently by this configuration of technologies. And this has been picked up both by, um, by the mainstream. So here you've got an article from the Financial Times saying enslave the robots and free the poor. Quite a radical vision for the Financial Times to be advocating. It's been picked up by people in Silicon Valley. So you've got Zuckerberg there next to a man in a funny hat um, saying uh, basic income. Uh, so you might have heard about this demand, obviously, it, it has different effects in different parts of the world and different kind of outcomes. But one solution is posed that universal basic income will deal with the fallout from these technologies. And you also have the radical left making similar demands about it. So politically, it's across the spectrum and understanding that this is a turning point. Next slide, please, Hugh. The trouble is the assessments of the future are quite uh, variegated and uh, you know, contoured according to different geographical differences, which he's going to talk about um, a little later. But different uh, assessments suggest different percentages of the amount of people that will be uh, will lose their jobs to this. So here you've got three very different figures from a group set of academics, Frey and Osborne, a consultancy, Price Waterhouse Coopers, and then OECD. Um, so they have different interests, different imperatives, different ways of telling a story according to different audiences but they also look at different things so some of them look at jobs to be displaced whole jobs some of them look at tasks individual tasks that might be displaced now looking at them in different ways we get different pictures and the issue being is that the technology of these robots is not currently able to perform a lot of the tasks that humans perform so the tesla factory is a good example Elon Musk, who you, you might be familiar with, the entrepreneur and, and kind of wild guy, um, had the idea that you would replace all humans in the Tesla factory with robots and machines. And within a week, the whole thing had ground to a halt. Car production had slowed down completely. They had to bring humans back in to clear up the mess that the robots were making. They were dropping things on the floor. They weren't able to react to pick it up. So there's still teething problems with that type of thing. And what you're seeing is actually automation AI setting in much more in things like the legal sector, where a piece of tech can fill out a contract quite efficiently and displace kind of lower level legal sector work much more adeptly than it can replace someone working on a production line. Um, so that, that's quite a, there's a lot of, that's counterintuitive to the way that we see it pre presented in the media. Um, and of course, COVID is changing things again because social distancing is making companies invest in new digital and technological solutions for things that were previously performed by co-located humans. So COVID-19 could compound these tendencies to really actually this time make things different. Next slide, please, Hugh. More often than not, we're not seeing humans replaced by technology, but we're seeing human labor augmented by technology. Um, and you know, notable here is the rise of the platform economy, um, so the gig economy. Now, in, informal work is nothing uh, new in a lot of parts of the world, but in, the, in, in countries like the UK, the rise of the platform has reshaped working um, um, expectations of what work is like. Different kind of contractual statuses, different kind of um, relationships between uh, employees and the platform, and have really fundamentally uh, reconfigured things like where do we get our food from, deliveries, etc. How do we take rides around the city? Um, next slide, PCU. And this augmentation of work by technology is not necessarily replacing uh, jobs, but it's actually creating new kinds of jobs. So the rise of um, the on-demand online economy, e-commerce, Amazon, has created these vast um, 
uh, hinterlands of warehouses, logistics firms around ports and other um, other transport hubs. Here you've got Jeff Bezos, that's the real Jeff Bezos, not a robot, um, overlooking the shop floor um, at Amazon, where people are very tightly measured in terms of their movements. So they wear you know, wearable devices, basically they're managed by algorithms, where do they go? So actually the work that's being reshaped there is much more the managerial work is becoming outsourced to algorithms. You've got your Deliveroo rider there, but also academics down there in the bottom corner our work is also being reshaped in this, especially in this virtual um, pandemic age, which hopefully by September things might be a little bit more back to normal. But you know, we find ourselves also having our work reshaped by technology in new ways. Rather than being replaced, it's being intensified, um, and you know that has advantages and uh, disadvantages for the workers that you see in this uh, in this slide. Next slide, please, Hugh. This is an example, actually, of, of, of technology and work. Hugh and I, we spend a lot of time chatting um, during our working day, um, uh, you know, talking about academic things and also non-academic things, um, using various platforms, um, email, teams. Now, our management can actually, if they wanted to, get data on how productive we were being. Were we spending all day in our meetings actually talking to one another about what we did at the weekend? Or are we being productive with our time? And through our Office 365 package, which is all of our integrated email, Microsoft Teams, et cetera, they can get this data and they could actually you know, find out a bit more about what we're doing. So there's this whole plenitude of analytics that have developed around work, um, which obviously could be quite negative for some workers. On the other hand, it could also be a positive thing for people to understand better how they're spending their time. Hugh, uh, next slide, please. Now, but this is actually nothing new. And I guess that's, this is where I'm interested in the changes and the continuities is that if you, you know, if we think about that kind of archetypal Taylorist or Fordist factory in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, um, work was quite closely measured there in a similar way. Technologies were, were reshaping work and, you know, bringing in different expectations about productivity and efficiency. But the difference was, and this is where HRM comes in, is that that produced quite strong workers' movements, strong industrial relations. Workers were able to bargain around those analytics and those forms of measurement that were facilitated by technology in support of better wages, you know, better working conditions um, in line with skill and productivity. And that's, a, that's quite a shift, but we're seeing a re-emergence of some of those struggles in things like the gig and the platform economy, where workers are mobilising in order to use those apps in support of better pay, better working conditions. So we're entering into a phase again where technology, workplace relationships are taking on new forms, which are interesting to put in historical perspective. Hugh? And finally, the pandemic. The pandemic has brought to light a lot of work that's absolutely pivotal and foundational to how society operates and our the caring and reproduction of human life. Um, and this work is often gendered and racialized um, in terms of the people who perform it. It's often low paid, you know, it's not rewarded. It's considered to be low skilled because a lot of it is seen to come naturally in terms of caring work in the health sector, uh, in the care sector, um, other forms of social, socially reproductive um, labor. And a, a key struggle now is for those workers to be recognized and remunerated in uh, you know to the to the degree in this new esteem in which they're held, and that's going to produce a lot of new, of new debates about the changing world of work. And it also reminds us that the future of work is not just about humans. Uh, sorry, not the other way around. Not just about technology um, and about technological changes, but it's about the humans at the centre of that, and the social and the political, the geographical and the cultural aspects that surround that. And I think Hugh's going to say a little bit about that um, now. Yeah, so as, as, as Harry said, the future of work is not just uh, all about technology, um, but the way that we look at it is we think about the future of work as this idea of being human centred or that it needs to be human centred. The idea that you know people and work and the way they work should be at the centre of kind of economic and social policy um, and business practice. And the idea that you know, we as, as, as workers, as employees, as students, everyone kind of has some degree of, of power and agency. And we're not kind of passive 
victims to these changes kind of being opposed uh, on us by external forces. Um, and I mean, as, as Harry said, with the, the case of Amazon, you know, we've seen uh, in recent weeks a kind of impetus for, for union drives at the Amazon warehouse in, in Alabama, which has been less about pay um, and being replaced by robots as more about the way workers are kind of monitored by algorithms and the way that the pace of work is being set by robots. Um, but we, you know, but these kind of forms of dehumanization and and an intensification of work uh, are not necessarily inevitable, and not something which are just there that's going to happen to us in the next five ten years. But a kind of a different outcome will require kind of different choices, and most importantly, a different distribution of power in the workplace. Um, whether that's actually in the workplace or whether that's at um, at the level of the nation state or whether that's um, globally as well. So kind of what I'm saying here is that which technology is used, how it's used, to what end or whatever is basically shaped by, by the power relations in society. So we know that if workers are organized and if they're given a voice um, and if governments support them in, in articulating that voice and being able to express that voice democratically and without interference, then you know, potentially technology has a potential to play a positive role in the future of work. We know that based on like what Harry was saying about the, the history, the history of work. We know that if workers are giving that voice, there is uh, a positive role to be to be had. In contrast, on the other end, is that when worker organization, when participation, when communication is curtailed, and employers have a much more kind of short-term um, uh, economic kind of focus, short-term economic gains, then we can anticipate that technology is going to exacerbate inequality, it's going to affect the terms, conditions of employment, and potentially have uh, massive deleterious impacts on, on workers' lives. So, you know, in other words, technology and, and aspects associated with technology in the future of work, it's not an ex it's kind of an exogenous force, but one shaped by human decisions um, and one shaped inherently by that power and, and the power balance between capital and labor. Um, so as Harry's already said, um, you know, the future of work, the futures of work is, is not something which is kind of inevitable and, and something set in stone, but is also something that's not felt the same by everyone everywhere. Um, because work is inherently embedded in, in geography, in culture, and the institutions uh, that make up, you know, the labour market. So even if we were to believe that there was one future of work out there, it's not going to be the same in every single country. Um, and so, you know, the impact of technology and changes to the world of work will depend crucially on, on the state, uh, whether it provides its citizens with, with social protection, for example, and we've got um, the um, top uh, right-hand uh, diagram there shows social protection um, expenditure by, by different countries. And as you can see, this is vast differences between countries in terms of the amount of government support provided for social protection. Obviously, super, really, really important at the moment with, pan uh, with the pandemic and a lot of people being thrown out of work and then relying on the government or hoping that the government will provide some sort of um, support. It'll also depend on, on inequality, whether that's high or low. And we've got um, the graph here, the top left-hand corner, looking at the share of national income going to the top 10% uh, in number of countries, and that this is increasing over time, even though you get organizations uh, like the World Bank saying that technology is the potential to reduce inequality. Um, whereas we see in reality, inequality is rising at an exponential um, rate over the last 30, 40 years, at least on this graph. And if we look at other countries, it's even more um, extreme. It'll also depend on what sort of labor protections there are, not just social protection in terms of, uh, you know, employment protection if you've lost your job, but also the actual labor protections you have in work. So how many hours you work, whether you have access to a trade union, whether you have access to democratic voice, um, whether you've got stuff like maternity leave, paternity leave, what discrimination at work, and then also other fundamentals like child labor and forced labor. So the future work is going to play out in different places just by the fact that there are different labor protections in different countries. Um, but also that um, 
the future of work often focuses on those kind of blue chip, um, fancy Google, Facebooks, Amazons, these types of, of kind of brand enclaves. Um, but the nature of sectors and the nature of, of, of what type of work is obviously really important, but also the, the, the makeup of the labor market. So the degree to which there's um, the degree to which the informal economy, for example, plays a significant role in, in, in particular countries is obviously going to have an impact. And there we go. We've got a uh, in, um, graph there, figure there that shows um, informal employment and total employment. So kind of what I'm trying to get to grips with here is that the root of, of these kind of questions is very much in the power imbalances between capital and labor, which is different within different countries but also plays out at kind of a global level. And this is really noticeable if we look at um, global value chains, for example, um, where you know, these big multinational corporations have amassed massive amounts of market value, while those workers right at the bottom of those value chains have struggled to pay, uh, you know, to struggle, uh, paid less than a subsistence uh, wage, less than a living wage. And we've seen that really recently, if you look at like the impact of garment workers um, with the pandemic in Bangladesh, some estimates put it as more than 80% of, of garment workers are now facing hunger amid falling wages and the widespread job losses. Um, we've also seen how the pandemic has been used by particular employers, for example, to, um, to attack union membership. We've seen that uh, where particular uh, job losses have been uh, linked to union membership. We've seen that in Myanmar, we've seen that in Cambodia, we've seen that in Bangladesh, we've seen that in India. Um, and workers have said that they've been disproportionately kind of targeted due to wanting to have an independent voice, wanting to bargain on behalf of, of their members and improve their conditions of work. So obviously there's this kind of need to challenge the, the narrow and kind of uh, toxic corporate control over how technology is, is developed and deployed. There's also a question around the rules of the game and these rules of the game, which have always existed and the kind of same problems that we've always uh, faced. And how can we reverse um, some of these um, some of these major challenges? How do we need to rethink HRM and the future of work uh, to kind of tackle that? So that brings us kind of full circle, really, back to the program and back to, to, to this new masters launching in, in, in September. Because this is kind of the things, these are kind of the debates we're interested in. These are the, what we think are some of the most important questions to be asked at the moment when, it, when, you, think about, when you think about society and the challenges facing, facing the world. Um, and that's kind of what this program's about. It's about human resource management because we're, we're, the argument is that human resource managers have obviously a fundamental role to play when we think about the future of work and what it might mean and what it could mean. Um, but also that although in the title of this program it says the future of work, there are multiple futures of work out there. And as potential students, what we're interested in, the kind of ideal student that graduates this program, is one that comes away with not just the really good intangible and tangible skills that you get as studying a postgraduate, um, postgraduate degree at one of the best universities in the world, but also that you come equipped with that understanding and agency around what the future of work might mean and the pivotal role of yourself as individuals in shaping that uh, for, for the better. So that's, that's kind of our taste of the lecture, kind of a bit about the program, a bit about kind of, you know, um, putting some of these debates uh, up in the air. And we're, we're really now interested um, about any questions that you have, um, whether it's about, something that myself and Harry have said, whether it's something about the, the actual specifics of the program, whether it's about what it's like to live in Bristol, whether it's about scholarships, whatever it is, we're interested in, in, in your questions um, about the program. So um, uh, Bhavna, maybe we go to you now and, and hopefully there's been some, some conversations and hopefully myself, Harry and Doris will be able to, um, to answer them. Absolutely. Um, that was a great session. Should say, and you both connected really well with the students because I have received a lot of queries. So let's move on. Okay, so um, first query is uh, Is Master of Data Science course um, available? Uh, 
so I'll take that one. Uh, so yes, we do in the university, we do have uh, an MSc in data science. Um, if the student requ requested uh, admissions for 21 entry, I would have to say no, um, it is already closed and uh, anyone looking for data science um, or also computer science, any of those um, data um, um, computery degrees, they close very early. So anybody wanting to apply, do it quickly. Um, we only have one intake. And that's the same for the, the, the masters we've just heard about in management. The intake is September. So um, students can apply a year ahead, but if you leave it too long, you might run the risks that all the seats are taken. So I would always advise go quickly. Um, the um, offers will be conditional. So you can, uh, you can and you should apply before you have qualified. Okay, don't, work, don't wait for your degrees, certificates. I mean, that's part of the process. The main thing is to get your application in. Thank you, Doris. Can I, can I also just say, sorry, just quickly on that as well, that we actually also have a new master's in the School of Management on business analytics um, as well, which might be of, 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 of interest um, as well, if you're kind of thinking about that connection between business education and some of that kind of computer science-y stuff. I don't know anything about it, but it is uh, but it is a new master's that we're launching. And as far as I can tell, it looks absolutely fantastic as well. You're absolutely right, Hugh. It's been incredibly popular, in particular in India. And um, I think if it hasn't closed yet, then it's probably about to. Um, that's kind of like a general warning as soon as, and it's in a way a reflection of what you were talking about as well. How is our world ch changing in terms of what, what, what do we need to be able to do at work? Um, and data uh, seems to be at the core of so many things. And the minute uh, a course in its course title has analytics, data, um, computer, anything like that in it, coupled in your case with finance, that is an absolute uh, winner in terms of uh, catching the attention of students. That brings with it the fact that you do have to be on your marks when you want to apply. Thank you. And the yes. HRM and the future of work is also very interesting. So, <laughs> oh, of course. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on to next query, that is, what are new trends in HR technology? Do you mean I'll take that one, Harriet? I think. Um, well, obviously, what's really important uh, and, and interesting at the moment is the way that the workplace is is is, is shifting. I mean, the fact that we're doing this uh, on, I'm actually in the office at, at the moment, but Harry's at home. I don't I hope he doesn't mind me saying he's home. Um, shows how, if you think about kind of traditional forms of organisation that are, um, if you think about like the knowledge economy, for example, that you've now got a lot of highly skilled workers working from home. Um, and so HRM has been seen as being kind of sort of turned upside down by some of these uh, changes. Now, the, the thing that we're kind of interested in is the way in which uh, HRM can potentially monitor its workers uh, in, in new and innovative uh, ways, which potentially increase control of, of workers, because now you can't just go down the corridor and see if people are working. Now that you need to find new and different ways of monitoring people, whether it's how often they're using Teams or um, how quickly they can respond to, to, to emails. And so you'll see a lot of these debates. If you put in HRM and the future of work, you'll see stuff produced by Deloitte and KPMG and these other kind of consultancy organizations who, who I don't think they necessarily know what the new practices in HRM are gonna be, uh, but they definitely speculate. Um, but the, the way that the way that we work and the way that we interact with each other when we think about our team and the kind of goals and stuff that we're we're being set has been turned kind of upside down and and has been and has been challenged um but it's also still the like the fundamentals around human resource management around equity and voice at work and things like that are still just as important as they ever were pre-pandemic um, and maybe there's ways that technology can kind of reinforce um, those goals and objectives of human resource management around equity and around voice of, of the workforce. Um, so COVID-19 has exacerbated in some sectors and in some industries, the kind of um, digital monitoring of, of workers um, in, in certain ways. Um, and 
we always got to be kind of wary of these things and make sure that they're being used in a in a way which is beneficial uh, for uh, for workers. Basically, I don't know how if you if you wanted to come in on any of those points. Yeah, I'll come in just to say also with COVID nineteen is that the relationship between um, technologies available to us, if you think about kind of wearable wearable tech like a Fitbit, for instance the translation of that into a workplace context where companies are increasingly interested in the in the health and well-being of their workers technology can have a, a dual use both of surveillance and monitoring of work but also uh, a closer company interest in health and well-being that can be measured through various forms of devices and apps um, and that can be beneficial obviously but there are ethical moral um issues around that as well as industrial relations and human resource management issues which you know we're obviously keen to explore with you on this um on this program all right um thank you for the answer next question is how does the accreditation system work in the uk um cim cipd uh, yeah, I'll answer that. Um, so at the moment, this program is uh, is not CIPD accredited, uh, but it, it, it's potentially something we're going to look at um, in the future. But at the moment, there isn't um, any accreditation uh, on this program. All right. Um, next question is, I am I'm from a CS background, but I have not studied any management subjects. So would I be eligible? Sorry, what was the what was the background they had studied? Sorry, uh, computer science. Computer um, science. So for this uh, for this program, um, it requires a undergraduate degree in kind of a social science um, subject, um, unless uh, unless the student has devoted a, a strong uh, a significant amount of their of their course to something around work or HRM. So for example, you might have done something. Uh, you might have done an, a non-social science or law uh, undergraduate, but you did your dissertation on something around the future of work, then we would, we would maybe consider um, the student applying. But if you've done uh, neuroscience um, and haven't really touched upon any of these HRM or future of work issues in any of your course, then you wouldn't be suitable for this course. But I will say that we have a uh, MSc in management uh, with international human resource management, which is also launching in, in September. And I haven't talked about that at all. I'm not the program director for it, but I, I'm happy if people have some general questions around that to, to answer. And that one is what we call a generalist master's. So this, the one we've been talking about today, a specialist means you need to have done an undergraduate in a kind of related subject. MSc management with international human resource management is a generalist master's, which means you could have studied whatever degree you wanted, uh, whatever degree you studied previously, you could still get onto that course if you still met the other entry requirements around grades and uh, IELTS score and all these kind of things. So potentially for this student, if they're interested in, in studying human resource management, maybe the MSc management and international human resource management might be, um, might be more suitable for them. Okay, thank you for the answer. Um, next question is why do you why do you not offer a placement options with masters? I'll come in on that one as well. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, so we don't offer a, a placement because well, most of our masters are one year full time uh, programs. We do have one part time um, program here in the School of Management, but most of our courses are full time. And um, the reason for that is uh, primarily because a lot of people are using this as a kind of a um, a, a stopgap in between doing their undergraduate and going on to kind of full time uh, employment. Uh, and so a lot of people want that full one year intensive uh, uh, program. And also it's really important for students to be able to because there's so many linkages between all the stuff that we're covering, being able to do it in one year has a lot of kind of um, economies of scale when we think about the skills and stuff that you get out of the program. Now, we don't offer a placement primarily because there isn't much time to offer a placement when you've got a, a one year master's. Um, you are you are studying intensively during uh, first two teaching blocks and then you're writing a dissertation. Um, and so uh, your actual kind of free time to do a, a placement, it would be really difficult, I'd say. Now, I will say, though, that we do have a really fantastic uh, career services here in the University of Bristol who might be able to help you 
uh, get uh, a placement uh, after um, your postgraduate um, course. Um, so although we don't have like a formal placement um, in, as far as I know, any of our master's programs in the School of Management, um, we do have the career services that might be able to uh, help you if you're interested in, in having an internship or a work placement um, shortly after the, the program is finished. If I may add to that, um, that's, certainly the, 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 that's certainly the reason the program is a full 12 month intensive program, um, so you wouldn't have the time uh, for a full placement, but there are two factors here. Um, as you already mentioned, we have a really, really good career service, so they can also put you in touch with mentors from your industry. So we have postgraduate mentoring opportunities, for example, um, which, which gets you right in touch with people in your indust uh, the industry you are looking at. Um, but the other thing is also that with the change in the visa regulations, so you now have the post-study work visa again for two years after graduation. And basically that has removed all the um, visa requirements. You don't need a sponsor. You can work for a full two weeks uh, sorry, two years after you've graduated. And that could be a placement because placements are usually not, you know, they may not be full time, they may not be um, highly paid. So they, they, you couldn't have done them before because you would have needed a visa. Now you don't. Uh, so, so you could, after your degree, after you've fully finished graduating, you can spend those two years really building up your career, getting into those companies that you are aiming at and building up a portfolio because after that, after two years, you will need to get a work visa. But of course, you'll be a much more employable known entity, particularly if you are going to global employers, for example, or, or consultancies, you know, they, they will have tried you out. You will be a completely different person um, and, and a, good, a good candidate to, to, for them to appoint. Okay. Thank you for the answer. Um, next query is, uh, is the new course open for non-management stream? If not, would any additional course be accepted? So, sorry, Bhavna, can you repeat the, the, the question? So student is asking that if this new course is open for new management stream. Uh, Hugh, if I might. Hmm. So in there. So, so I think this relates to the first degree the student would be coming uh, with. Yes. Uh, often they're talking about streams, could be science stream, could be uh, management. But I think you've already said that actually, you know, it's a social science, the, the particular course here we talked about is a social science based one. So it draws from much wider than just management. Um. The entry requirements, by the way, they are on the page. So if students are really keen to inquire, they should go onto our website, bristolac.uk, find the School of Management, very easily found, and then just work your way through to the, um, uh, to the School of Management. Um, I, I have, I can't, uh, you know, I've got the uh, link in the chat, but I don't think your YouTube users will be able to see that, but that is easily found. Sure. If, if you, even if you Google uh, MSc Human Resource Management in the Future of Work, it's the it's the top it's the top hit. Um, so yeah, so if you've done if you've done a management degree, a management stream before, then uh, and you're interested in in developing your skills and knowledge and stuff around human resource management in the future of work further, then this would be this would be a good place for you to uh, this would be a good uh, master's for you to do. If you haven't studied social sciences. Uh, or law or related subjects, do check the list on, on, on the website, then we do have a generalist masters that will, um, that you don't need to have um, those kind of um, uh, specific undergraduate degree entry requirements. But yeah, all the information is, is, is on the website. All right, let's move on to our next query. That is what, um, what future implications will COVID-19 have on HR? Sorry, sorry, Bhavna. It might be my, my end or not, but you cut up there just at the last the last bit. Sorry, what did you say? What future implications will COVID-19 have on HR? Yeah, I mean, that's that's something with, which we're really trying to get to grips with at the moment. Um, I mean, some of the stuff we've already talked about uh, that, that Harry's mentioned around wearable tech, around potential 
uh, different forms of digital surveillance at work as people are, are working uh, from home. But you can also think about the, just the nature of the workplace and social distancing and kind of more kind of minute specific details um, around there. Now, the biggest impact of the, the pandemic has been uh, people being thrown out of employment um, and how the massive impact that that has obviously had on people's uh, livelihoods and, and their way of their way of life. And this is a fundamental question and challenge for for future kind of HR leaders um, around um, how do you, you know, the common kind of discourse at the moment is about how you build back better, uh, the be a better world is possible, all these kind of debates are happening at the moment. And we don't know, we know what the impact so far has been of COVID-19 on HR, and most of it has been around a loss of in employment, potentially an intensification of work, especially an intensification of work in academia. Um, and also, as Harry said, this um, unequal impact of, of, of COVID and the pandemic. It's had an un unequal impact on, on uh, the more kind of informal workers. It's had an unequal impact on women. Um, so these things are, we know what's happened then. Now what's gonna happen in the future is still up to, up to debate really. And that's kind of why, why this program I think is so exciting because it, we're going to be talking about these things as they kind of unfold and unravel in real time. But Harry, you want to come in? Yeah, I mean, the other thing is, um, you know, at the same time as COVID is potentially making firms want to invest in digital solutions um, to the kind of new age of social distancing. So, you know, one thing we might look at here is the fact that service sector work you know, and services obviously representing a, a, a large proportion of economic activity in a lot of economies now have often been seen as quite difficult to automate or to bring in technology to make more productive because often the work is low paid. Um, you know, it's really, it rests upon human relationships. So, you know, service with a smile. Um, it relies upon humans being in the moment of, uh, of the service kind of interaction. Um, that's, you know, this has opened up a, a, a possibility now because of unemployment, you know, for creative destruction, I guess, in the economy, but also the desire of people for less human contact to actually start thinking about other ways. So you're hearing things like automated, um, um, automated cleaning in, in hotels, for instance, or um, the Amazon store that didn't have any staff where you could walk in and you do your own shopping. In fact, we've seen this in supermarkets as well in some places where now you can go in and do your own shopping without having to go to a checkout. You do the barcode scanning. But that's kind of limited to some extent. And I think a key trend we're going to be seeing is whether or not coming out of the pandemic, people start to have a desire for more human centered solutions to the world of work to resist the digitalization and digital transformation of the workplace and return to um, you know, to gain more meaning out of the, out of human interaction and being around other people. So there's a kind of two movements there which pull in different directions. Um, and it's, I guess it's the job of, of human resource managers and people involved in the processes of human resources like trade unions and governments um, and employers and employees to try to kind of navigate and work out those, um, those tensions that arise coming out of the pandemic. Thank you for the answer. Um, next question is, what are the industrial tie-ups as part of the last term of the course? Sorry, the industrial, sorry, I get, I, keep having, I, I, I think it's, I think it's on my end, sorry, the industrial. Industrial tie-ups uh, in terms of internships or job, job placements. Yeah, Doris, do you want, do you mind taking that one? Um, so uh, industrial tie-ups, you mean um, arrangements we might have or relationships we might have with um, particular employers. So that's quite a common, commonly asked question. Um, and um, this, this, these programs are quite new, I think. So I don't know, uh, Hugh, uh, so commonly that would be uh, if, um, if 
in, and we have it in, in some of our other masters that are more established and have been around for years and years, where, you know, um, there are links with industry, for example, so that students who are studying on their, uh, on those kind of courses that they have, um, some that they benefit from that link. Now, um, Hugh, I don't know what, what uh, as I said, this is, these, this course is new or relatively new. Um, so is there anything in the planning? Yeah, so um, yeah, like you said, like this is launching in, in September and we are in conversation with a lot of kind of industry connections at the moment and way that we can uh, combine what we're interested in the course and what they're interested in in terms of future skills of, of potential employees of, 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 their, of their workplaces. But of course, when you're dealing with something like human resource management, the future of work, you have also industry interested in the kind of research that we're doing around this as well. So um, we don't have any like specific kind of the, the School of Management has a, a, a lot of industry associations that they have worked uh, worked with in the past. And there's there's lots of information on the website about that. There isn't anything specifically connected to this program as as of yet. It uh, doesn't mean that it's going to be in the future, but because it's launching in September, these kind of debates and conversations are still going on. Um, but the School of Management as a, as a whole, as, as, as the School of Management in which the program is based, has a lot of in, uh, industry uh, connections and associations. And, and we combine that with our kind of career service to, um, you know, we're, we're one of the best kind of ranked universities for employability, for example, and graduate outcomes. Um, and that comes down to our really good connections with, um, with not just UK employers, but also global employers um, as well. Thank you for the answer. Um, next question is, what is the process to clear and gain the CIPD certification and the charges? Yes, yeah, so all the information about CIPD accreditation and charter is available is available on their on their website. So this program doesn't have uh, a CI is not CIPD accredited at the moment, although it's uh, something we're considering, but it's not at the moment. Um, but all the information about how to get CIPD accreditation is, is found on um, CIPD's website, which you can find uh, easily on Google. All right, so this was the last query. And um, let's quickly check. Yeah, so this was the last query from our audience. So it's time to wrap up now. So thank you, that was a great session. And uh, you have highlighted all the key points providing expert guidance for all you know, interested Indian students. And I'm positive that this session will be of great help to all students. And uh, we look forward to more of such interactive engagements between the University of Bristol and SIT India. So thank you so much. So is there anything additional you would like to um, see or add on. No, just to say um, thanks for thanks for coming along today, and and um, thanks for your your interesting uh, questions as well. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank thanks, you so much. thanks from me as well. All the information, as as we've said so many times, are definitely online. And watch out for our other webinars. There's lots of webinars happening. So just go on the website landing page. All the virtual events are there. Ask, answering questions about accommodation, living in Bristol, all that kind of stuff as well. Thank you so much.